Hi, everyone, and welcome to APQC's webinar on 2023 Supply Chain Challenges and Priorities. I'm Marisa Brown, and I'm APQC's Senior Principal Research Lead for Supply Chain Management. And today we're going to be talking about, first, how did we end the year last year in the end of 2022 to set the stage for what's coming next in 2023? Then we're gonna shift into forward gear and we're gonna take a look at some of the expectations and trends that are facing supply chain for the coming year and the next three years. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time looking at the priorities in the top four focus areas within supply chain. And we're gonna wrap up by looking to the future. See where organizations are placing their bets for what comes next. And the one thing I will give you a, a sneak peek, spoiler alert, the key word for the year that we're seeing is stabilize. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the webinar today. And I also have four polls throughout the webinar. I look forward to hearing from you guys as to what you all think about what's happening in supply chain. So with that said, let's take a quick look here. about the. Let's look at the research that forms the foundation and the basis for what I'm gonna share with you today. So this is now our ninth annual Supply Chain Management Priorities and Challenges Research here at APQC. And it really looks at how did supply chains perform in the prior year? And then what are those changes and trends facing us coming up? And we're also gonna take a look at, in this webinar, just the top four areas. But I will provide you with some links to where you can get the full results of the research and look at all areas within supply chain. We have already published both a white paper and the survey report from this year's research, as well as seven different industry cuts and a number of comparative reports so that you can take a look at what we learned from our globally diverse audience that participated. This year, we had 347 different organizations across the regions and across multiple industries that participated. So we've been in for a wild ride the last few years. I don't think there's anyone, supply chain professional or average person on the street, who doesn't know that supply chains have been disrupted. But what we have been able to do is better adapt and better respond to some of those disruptions that have been facing us. But 2022 was an interesting year. I call it year three of the pandemic. And really, we don't know when this pandemic is going to be over. We can hope and pray that it's in the rearview mirror, but we'll see. So one of the first questions I have for you, and this is our first poll, so audience participation alert. How did your organization fare? How would you say your supply chain did in 2022 in the face of the COVID pandemic? Did your organization, your supply chain organization just fall apart? Did it barely survive like fingernails hanging on a ledge? Or was it just sort of neutral, a little bit meh? Um, do you think you had some modest success, kept the trains moving, so to speak? Or did you find that your supply chain saved the day? Put on that superhero cape and fly out there to help your organization survive. So please take a moment, pick one, and let me know what you think. It's been interesting to see how supply chains have adapted and responded since 2020. And we're going to go ahead and close the poll now and take a look at your responses, and then we'll compare those to the organizations that participated in our research. So take a look at that. 64% of you said you had modest success. Well, congratulations, because that is really an incredible feat when you think about the unexpected, unanticipated disruptions that happened in 2022, not just from the pandemic, but we had all kinds of labor disruptions, geopolitical disruptions, global trade and tariff disruptions. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we see 5% said you barely survived, 23% of you were neutral, and 9% put on the superhero cape. So let's compare that with the participants we had in our research. So what we saw was 20% saying they saved the day, 44% having modest success, 17% were neutral, 9% barely survived, and 2% completely failed. And what I think is interesting to note is that when I compare this to the prior few years, 
2020, 2021, 2022, what we see is that almost twice as many supply chains were in the bottom two categories, the completely failed or barely survived. So twice as many last year compared to the prior year. And at first I was like, but we're heading out of this pandemic, shouldn't we be doing better? But what I think we're seeing is a bifurcation or a splitting into two groups of those organizations that have figured out how to be more resilient in the face of all these changes and those organizations that just can't make it. Um, and so again, as we look at where we go from here, there's a lot of things that organizations need to do to be prepared because none of us really know what's coming next. We have all kinds of predictive analytics and maybe you have a crystal ball, but since we can't really tell, we need to be prepared for whatever might come. So let's take a look at how did our supply chains do when it came to hitting our business goals last year? So 53% of respondents in our research were on target, achieved or exceeded their business goals for last year. And about a third of them be, met or beat their competitors or their peers' performance. So now we saw that on the prior slide, about 80% of organizations said that they survived the pandemic, but surviving doesn't really mean success, doesn't mean thriving. It means you didn't fail, right? Now, the fact that 47%, almost half of our research participants missed their goals, that's rather alarming. And if we put this into some context, as I said, we've been collecting this data for a number of years. So let's take a quick look. We have 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022 on the slide. And what you can see is that we took a big hit in 2020. No surprise to anyone. And then in 2021, we started to bounce back and we continued in 2022 to see improvement versus our peers and competitors and a slight drop in meeting business goals. So you might say we're almost back to where we were before the pandemic and that's a good thing. And it is. But at the same time, if we look at where we were before the pandemic, not such high numbers there, 56% were hitting business goals and 50% said that they were on target with their peers or competitors. So we've got some opportunities here to really make some strides. And when we dig in a little bit, where did we see in 2022, the bright spots and the, the alarming parts? And we saw organizations were doing better in terms of getting to their sales goals, right? We're a little, we're out of some of the chaos and the frenzy of the early years of the pandemic when it was, we just all went from life as we knew it to just utter chaos and, and who knew what was happening next. Well, now we're seeing supply chains better able to pivot and better able to adapt and respond. But one of the things we saw last year that I think is a little alarming is that organizations did better in terms of their cost savings and hitting those goals, but fewer met or exceeded their customer service goals. And so well, this is compared to prior years. So what we see is that this internal focus on saving money may come at the expense of satisfying your customers. And that's worrisome for a long-term outlook. And I would say to turn this around, organizations need to focus on greater transparency so that not only are you saving money, but you're not doing it at the expense of your customers. You're figuring out where the best places are to trim some of those costs. And I'll just make a comment here that those of you who have attended other webinars where I've presented have probably heard me say before, but even when performance is poor, it's really important to continue measuring because when the, we're out of this slump, let's say, or maybe we're not gonna be out for a long time, or maybe this is the new level of normal, who knows? But what you need is that reality check. This is for real how the organization is performing. And you need this for longer term comparisons. You need this to identify the most important areas for improvement. You need this to better understand how your supply chain is truly performing. It's not about pointing fingers or assigning blame. It's about looking at how far have things moved and calibrating the effort needed to close the gaps. So enough of the rear view mirror. Let's move forward. Let's shift to looking at 
What do people see as trends coming down the road? What's holding them back? And what's the outlook for funding? So let's start with the trends that people think are going to most impact supply chains in the next three years. And this is a combination of people who said this would be a major impact and also a moderate impact. And we know, everyone on this webinar is probably aware, that supply chains are in the spotlight, right? People blame supply chains nowadays for things that are far beyond the scope of supply chains, but we don't want to be that scapegoat that gets blamed whenever there's a problem. But what we can do is turn that spotlight into something that we use for our benefit in supply chain. And so what we're seeing is that there is more and more attention being paid to supply chain and we're getting more and more investment and as a result, better tools to help us understand what's happening. And this is where big data and advanced analytics comes into play. This is in the top spot as far as where more people think there's gonna be a significant impact. And it was last year too, this is unchanged. And what we're seeing is that during the pandemic, organizations launched automation projects at a rate that we've never really seen before. Everyone talked about how things that used to take three years happened in three months. But for the data from all this automation to be useful, we have to see it get organized and presented in ways that can inform people rather than just confuse them. So deeper and more timely analysis is gonna give organizations the information they need to pivot faster and spell the difference between success and failure. And we're only going to see an increase in the volume of data facing us as supply chain professionals. So we need to figure out what kind of technologies, some of which are very much emerging, some of which are in the news all the time now, but what are those technologies that can enable organizations to make faster and hopefully better decisions? Moving up into the number two spot is the impact of global trade and tariff uncertainties. And there has been so much movement on the global chessboard in the past year, whether it's what's happening in Ukraine or China, or even the trend toward near shoring or ally shoring or friend shoring, or just moving your supply chain locations closer to your customers. Much of this disruption is anticipated to continue in the coming years, but it's not easy for organizations to relocate supply chain pieces of your supply chain. It's not a quick, it's not a simple thing. You need available skilled labor. You need the infrastructure, the roads, the ports. These are all prerequisites to relocating parts of your supply chain. So there's a lot that has to be done to identify and vet these locations and new suppliers to deliver the required materials at the volumes that your organizations need. And a lot of this is outside of your control. So all you can do is really try to be prepared right? Plan A, plan B, plan C, plan Q. Test them all and make sure you understand, you know, what can happen and what your organization's response might be. And then just briefly, the third big trend is sustainability. And interestingly enough, this moved up from last year, but the year before last year, it was pretty high on the list. And what happened was as organizations moved into more of a survival mode, sustainability fell from the top three it was still high on the C-suite agenda and the top of the organization, but the people executing the daily operations of the organization had moved priorities into just keeping the lights on and product flowing. Well, now that we're past the frenzied hyper demand stage, we hope, organizations are revisiting their sustainability efforts. And we're seeing that because there's so much pressure coming from multiple sources now, whether it's government regulations, consumer desires, um, the media, right? Organizations have to figure out how to get a more sustainable end-to-end -end supply chain. And you can't go it alone here. You've got to collaborate with your stakeholders and your supply chain partners, both upstream and downstream. And so what we're seeing is that you need to be able to prove the data about your emissions and your entire value chain's emissions. And there's increasing in certain parts of the world anti-greenwashing legislation. So organizations can't just make these lofty goals about net zero and carbon neutrality without now having the data to back it up. And then a lot of companies where the rubber meets the road is in supply chain. So we're seeing an increased focus and an increased impact from this. And then rounding out the top six trends that we see, 
We have the digitization of supply chain, which really underpins so many of these other trends that we see. Process standardization, which is also a precursor in many cases for automation. And AI, artificial intelligence, and cognitive computing. And with the release of things like chat GPT, there has definitely been an increased interest in AI, and I bet next year we'll see that move up the list. There are a number of other trends that organizations expect will impact their supply chains. Um, wouldn't want to overlook the impact of cloud and mobile technologies, as well as the continued desire for many people in many parts of the world to work from home. Um, and we're also seeing robotic process automation and blockchain. Now, I will say that some of these have moved up and some have moved down the list. Blockchain fell way down. Um, in part because it's such a collaborative technology and organizations have to all be a part of it for a blockchain to work across supply chain. We're probably not there yet, but we'll see. I do want to point out that there is definitely an impact of industry on these trends. So the colorful chart you see on the screen is the order in which different industry participants ranked these trends for their impact on supply chain. So for example, if you look at this, the dark blue is the sustainability box, right? We've got green cloud services, big data and analytics is purple. And so the point is just to show you that no two industries are the same. So reading the media and listening to the media, you have to understand the context for which these things will play out inside your own organizations. And for something like the pandemic, which now, in many cases, is being relabeled endemic because it looks like it's just going to be with us forever and not go away. It's going to continue to impact us in unpredictable ways. But as we see more and more evolution, we're going to see that you know some industries separate from the others. And I will say that you will all receive a copy of the slides in the recording so you can study this eye chart in more detail. But now that brings us to a next, our next poll. So there's a lot of trends coming in and impacting supply chain, but sometimes we can't always move immediately to take advantage of them or to adapt to them. So what I want to know is what's holding you back? What are the biggest obstacles or the biggest obstacle that you face in your organization when it comes to improving your supply chain processes? So we all know we want to be more flexible, adaptable, and resilient, but why aren't we? Is it challenges related to communication, too much change, a lack of collaboration internally and externally, staffing shortage, difficult regulations and requirements, is technology getting in the way, or is it just a lack of budget and resources for process improvement? So please pick one, let me know what you think, and then I'll show you what our research participants shared with us. All right, so please, if you haven't already, vote in this poll. Answer what you think is the biggest obstacle that's getting in the way of your improvement of your supply chain. We'll go ahead and close the poll and let's see what we got. All right, number one, with 24% of you selecting it, is lack of collaboration internally and externally. That has absolutely been in the top three for the last several years. And I think part of that is, by definition, supply chain is a chain. It's links connecting. Now, it's not necessarily linear anymore. It may be more circular, but if you can't collaborate on either side, then there are going to be problems. The number two barrier is lack of budget or resources, which is interesting. And then it drops down to technology getting in the way. And then we've got a number of other problems facing organizations. Well, let me address what came up in our research, which is kind of interesting. So what popped to the top this year that had not been at the top was staffing shortages. Now, what we see is that, you know, supply chains aren't alone when dealing with a lot of movement in the workforce lately. You may have heard of the great resignation or the big quit, and then organizations scrambling we see in the media or in the news organizations doing across the board 10% layoffs here or there. So there are organizations cutting people in different roles that relate to supply chain. But at the same time, one of the biggest challenges behind this staffing shortage 
is it's not just bodies, but it's people with the skills needed to do the work. And that's where a lot of organizations are starting to realize the need to address this priority. It's understanding that supply chain is business critical and you can't move forward with giant gaping holes in your staff or with lack of appropriate skills. So this is an area where people are investing. Now, lack of collaboration, which was the number one for the attendees on this webinar, number two spot here, and also was number one last year. And one of the things that I will say here is that disconnects in the supply chain can lead to ripple effects that go all the way through and impact your customers and their ability to get their orders on time and complete and with all the pieces and parts that they need. So this is, I guess, I don't wanna say good news, but we saw that 80% of respondents in our research have modified their strategies to head off some of these challenges and obstacles and to increase their flexibility. When it comes to collaboration, APQC has a whole body of research on knowledge management, a lot of which is targeted at improving collaboration. So I will comment that at the end of this presentation, I have links to recommended content across the different parts of supply chain, including, including how to handle improved collaboration. So I guess the good news on lack of collaboration is there are proven approaches and techniques that can help. And for those of you who said the resources are an issue, we asked our, our participants, you know, what does it look like in terms of spending for supply chain management tools, technologies, innovation, initiatives, resources to get the work done? And we're seeing a shift from last year to more organizations holding their investment constant. So we see 41% said that it's gonna stay the same, but 50% anticipate an increase. That's great news. Last year, that was two thirds anticipating an increase. So what we're seeing is that organizations are starting to say, we're holding it constant, but it's at a higher level than it was before 2020. But regardless of whether the budget is ratcheting up or going down and only 9% anticipate a decrease. And I think that reflects the importance that supply chain has come to the recognition of the importance of supply chain by a lot of leadership. But regardless, regardless of what happens with the budget, it's important to think about where that money goes. And in the past few years, a lot of it went into technologies and systems. But going forward, there needs to be a concerted effort to focus on the people and to focus on making sure that organizations are investing in not only recruiting, but also retaining and developing the existing staff that they have. We recommend you set aside a portion of your budget if you haven't already for that kind of professional development of your supply chain folks. You don't wanna wait until it becomes a more critical issue. Okay, so kind of talked about big picture trends and obstacles and budgets. Now let's look at within supply chain, where are people saying that they're going to focus for 2023? So first we're gonna do a poll. And by now you guys know the process. I wanna know what do you think organizations are gonna make their top focus for this year? Do you think it's logistics, sourcing and procurement, manufacturing, supply chain planning, innovation, product development, order management? Please vote where you think the number one most important critical area is that organizations will be focusing. And while you're voting, I'll just comment that um, it takes all parts, all of these things that are on the screen right now, takes all of them to make sure your supply chain is adequately functioning and working correctly. I don't mean to say that one is more important than the other, except that organizations are strategizing how they wanna be successful. So please vote now. And we're gonna go ahead and close the poll. And let's see, sourcing and procurement, 45% of you, followed by supply chain planning. Well, that is really interesting. In our research, in fact, for the last few years, we've actually seen those first two flipped where supply chain planning was in the number one spot and sourcing and procurement in number two. But they're both the top of the list super important. And I think that what we're seeing is that there, 
the recognition that your supplier's success in a sense determines your own organization's success has taken hold now. So what we see is that 86% of our, or our of the organizations in our research, 86% have made supply chain planning an important focus area. Now we did let them select all that apply here, which is why it doesn't add up to 100%. But you see in order after planning is sourcing and procurement, and then innovation because organizations are looking for ways to do things differently. We can't just keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. A wise person once said that is the definition of insanity. We don't wanna go there. But what we're seeing is that on the right-hand side of the screen, order management and manufacturing and product development are also critical parts of the supply chain where organizations will be investing, but to a lesser extent, than planning, procurement, innovation, and of course, logistics and inventory management. So we'll go into depth on the first four. I just wanna say a brief word on these three on the right-hand side. So in order management, we're seeing a big focus on customer service. That moved to the top of the list as a priority within order management for this year. And I think it comes from the fact that customers are increasingly demanding greater transparency for their orders they're pushing organizations to do more to meet their expectations. It's not enough to just know your order shipped. You want to know where your order is. And you, people, individuals are being trained by their consumer experiences and bringing that into the workplace. Manufacturing. Here we saw production management and sustainability move ahead of automation and digitization as top focus areas for 2023. And I think what we're seeing here is that Sustainability across the board in multiple functions that make up supply chain rose up the list of priorities for this coming year. As new and pending reg re legislation and regulations are forcing organizations to shift from what used to be a voluntary into a mandatory reporting scenario, compliance to avoid penalties and fines has become a big focus. So understanding how you can incorporate more environmentally friendly, more ESG, not just the physical environment, but understanding the social and governance impacts of your supply chain is increasingly important. And the last comment is on product development. Here we're seeing that product development and supply chain need to work more closely together. And new product development and again, sustainability pop to the top of the list for priorities for this year. And what we're seeing is that organizations are focusing on how do they improve their new products that they're designing in such a way that the product components can be reused, recycled, repaired, or even refurbished? So organizations are definitely starting to more focus on designing their new products with sustainability in mind to then help them get that more circular supply chain with reduced waste. And a comment on inventory, um, industry. It's especially important here when you keep all this in mind to consider how much these focus areas are shaped by industry. Again, as with those top trends, we found that industry specific perspectives are having a bigger impact on focus areas for 2023 than they have in the past. As this chart shows, again, no two industries are the same. We do see consistency that supply chain planning is in the top two for everybody. But we also see that sourcing and procurement, which is the greenish color, is in the number two or three spot for everyone except for financial services, where we see logistics and inventory management moving up. We see innovation near the top. They're, they're all important. It's just the order varies by industry. So now we're going to shift into supply chain planning, and we're going to delve into the top four areas. And we're going to look at what the priorities are and where they're placing their actionable strategies for 2023. In supply chain planning, the number one focus area is demand planning and forecasting, and that's followed by automation and digitization. And in the face of continued disruptions, and then given the fact that we don't really know what the future holds, we certainly can make predictions based on leading indicators and other important predictive analytics, but we don't really know. So being able to have scenarios in place and being able to 
analyze our big data and use the advanced analytics, we can make better decisions. And we know now that historical data isn't enough to create our demand forecast going forward. So pulling in more data from more sources, as well as your suppliers and others, will really help your organization ensure that your data is reliable. And then you want to help make sure that it smoothly flows across a digitalized supply chain. And to make that happen, collaboration and communication moved into the top of the list for actionable strategies in supply chain planning. And I think that this reflects the increased recognition of the need for enhanced cross-functional relationships and data sharing. Given the complexities involved in supply chain planning, it's not really that surprising that 42% of our respondents are looking to implement new technologies and capabilities. There are new tools, it's just a matter of making sure that the accountabilities for using those tools are put in place. Which reminds me of one of my favorite stories from a bad news perspective. <laughs> one of the organizations I was talking to had invested in creating a supply chain control tower to really give them end-to-end -end visibility across their supply chain. And they invested time, money, human resources, created a beautiful tool. But what they'd forgotten to do was assign accountability for acting on the outputs of the control tower. So they built this thing and then it was like, okay, now who's gonna do something with the insights that we're getting? And everyone sort of looked at each other. So you can't forget that you have to assign that accountability, responsibility, who are you consulting, who's informed, and that needs to be done alongside or even advance of building the tool or implementing the tool. Now let's talk a little bit about sourcing and procurement. This was y'all's number one focus area. And here we see top of the list, vendor or supplier relationship management. And I think all the chaos and disruptions we've seen have really made clear the connection between your suppliers and your own organization's success. So, and at the same time, we also saw sustainability moving up the list here. So now you've got to build better relationships with your suppliers because you need their emissions data to be able to report as part of your own scope three reporting. So, I mean, you don't wanna face financial penalties or have your shipments disrupted because your suppliers didn't provide you with something you need. So APQC has been researching supplier relationship management for a long time now. And we have some actionable guidance we can give you on how to think about where to focus and how to take action on the different types of relationships you might have with your suppliers. But this is a critical area where technology can help, but it's not the 100% solution. You want to make sure your organization is that customer of choice when your suppliers are facing constraints and you know have to maybe put everyone on allocation. You want to make sure you're getting what you need. And the way to do that is to build those relationships, especially now if you're in a lull, maybe your organization isn't kind of hair on fire at the moment. At the same time, maybe it is. But if you have a lull, this is the time to really rethink and revisit how you're building those relationships. And when it comes to looking at the top actionable strategies for this year, we do see the technology followed closely by improving supplier relationships. And I think that headlines have shown, you know, organizations that your supplier's actions can come back to haunt you. And so implementing these can really help you build a more stronger and a transparent supply chain. Because you have to realize that it's not just your tier one suppliers now. You got to dig a little bit deeper and figure out how you can tap into your tier two, tier three, and so on. All right. So now we come to innovation. And innovation is essential for survival, you know? Um, and at first, some people were like, why is that on a supply chain survey? And it's because supply chains are constantly innovating. And what we see here is the top priorities are improving collaboration, I almost feel like a broken record, and operational and process innovation, ahead of product and service innovation. And I think that's noteworthy because this speaks to the need that organizations have for figuring out better and different ways of working and building a strong ecosystem across your value chain to better serve your internal and your external customers. 
And actually, APQC is going to be doing more research this year around the concept of ecosystems and ecosystems tied into innovation and how you really can drive better collaboration um, in, in many ways with all your stakeholders. And adopting a structured approach to innovation moved up the list this year. And I think it also reflects that you want to have a repeatable process for finding new and novel solutions to the challenges that you face. I would say in many companies, Individuals had to circumvent the established processes during the height of the pandemic, assuming that we're past the peak. And I would encourage you to go back and revisit what did they do? What lessons can you learn? What can be gained from looking at what worked in crisis mode that you might be able to adapt now? For example, if they shortcut the process and skipped a bunch of steps, well, do you really still need all those steps? Or can you revisit your process and say, hey, let's streamline this. Now that we implemented new technologies that enable remote work, for example, well, maybe we can also come back and change some of our business rules and some of our processes. So never miss an opportunity to do what knowledge management professionals call go above the flow. Right? On a daily basis, especially in supply chain, we are in the flow of our work. We are busy making sure that we're sourcing and manufacturing and delivering and doing everything you have to do in supply chain. Every now and then when you have those moments to reflect, it's important to step back and go above the flow of work and look at where you can make improvements. And I would suggest that having a structured approach for innovation is a key piece of that. And then comes logistics, the historical core of supply chain. Inventory management has been at the top of the list here for several years, and it's going to continue to be challenged by who knows what disruptions are coming our way, and also the forecasting difficulties. And when I say continuing disruptions, we may, in our lifetimes, hopefully never face another global pandemic like we had. That was a, a very rare event, right? But what's not rare is extreme weather events a hurricane, a tsunami, a tornado, regional events, local events that impact supply chains. And supply chains were dealing with those kinds of disruptions long before COVID appeared on the scene, but they were limited in scope and you could you know, navigate around it, you could reroute, you could figure out. But now what we're realizing is that these things will continue to occur and some of them with increasing frequency and it's best to be prepared. Going back to the days of being a scout and a scout leader, be prepared. Scenario planning, looking at all your different options and practicing the different plans. It's the difference between when an event happens, having that muscle memory that you can respond quickly versus standing there like a deer in the headlights. So in logistics, we're seeing automation and digitization as well. And what we're seeing is that organizations want to optimize their inventory. And this is such a tricky piece, right? You don't want too much because then you tie up all your money with inventory sitting on the shelf, but you don't want too little. Some people have said we want to replace just in time with just in case, but what does just in case look like? And where do you store the just in case inventory? Where along the supply chain? So there's a lot to figure out here. And part of doing that is organizations are trying to figure out how to keep costs down while juggling the need to service the customer. And I don't have all the answers, but I can say that one of the things we see for this year that's new in terms of a focus is reducing transportation costs. And I think that improved collaboration and communication continues to be key, even here. New technologies and capabilities can help you aggregate your data and derive insights from it. And then you can use that to hopefully optimize routes, consolidate your orders, design your network differently, but using commu clear communication and collaboration to turn opportunity into reality. So moving forward, we're a quarter of the way through 2023, which is a little mind boggling. I read some research that the pandemic disrupted many of our perceptions of time. In fact, I, I spoke with someone who told me that their customers would say, well, last year, blah, 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 blah. And she would stop them and say, no, that was two years ago. And I'm like, no, 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 it was last year. And she's like, no, I'm looking at the records. It was two years ago. 
we all seem to have entered a little bit of a time warp <laughs> where time is distorted, right? And, and what happened, was it last year, the year before, two years ago, three years ago? A lot of people divide time into pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. But what's happened is, regardless of our perception of time, there is an increased focus on supply chain. And with that focus comes some worry. So last poll for this webinar, tell me how concerned you are about the future of supply chains. With all the increasing technology, new and emerging technology, and you know, figuring out how we can better get greater transparency end to end, the focus on sustainability, there's a lot happening in supply chain. So how concerned are you? Are you extremely concerned? Moderately, somewhat, slightly, or you're not worried at all. We got this, we'll figure it out. So I'd love to see your thoughts on worry about the future of supply chain. All right, make your picks because we're gonna close the poll. And how did we do? All right, 43% of you were moderately concerned and 38% somewhat, 14% extremely. Huh, nobody is not at all concerned. That's probably a good thing. Um, we don't wanna get overconfident because the one thing we know is we don't know what's gonna come next, right? So I did a poll last year and um, what I found was that 28% were extremely concerned, 39% moderately, 23% somewhat. And then we did actually have 3% of people who weren't. So what can you do to alleviate the concern and turn that into something actionable? Because it does no good just to sit and fret. So at the beginning of this webinar, I mentioned that my word for the year is stabilize. And feel free to share your word for the year in the chat if you have one. But it has been a rough couple of years. But we do, as a global focus, seem to be past the frenzy and the extreme chaos and dumpster fire that we've seen in the past three years. And we're now into a different period of time. I don't know yet what 2023 will look like. We can't predict a boat getting stuck somewhere that it shouldn't be or some other unforeseen disaster. But what we can do to build stability is take four specific actions. First, standardize and optimize your processes. Leverage the knowledge that you have already inside your organization and from external sources. Capture the lessons you learned over the past three years and revisit where you can make those improvements. Compare your performance and find those better practices that you can use when the conditions are changing. Innovation in particular is one area where paying attention to process can enhance your organization's flexibility so that you can adapt to ever-changing conditions. Second, focus on your supplier relationships. And I think you all are well on your way since sourcing and procurement was the number one focus area many of you picked for this year, because this is key to ensuring transparency that you need, as well as communication throughout your supply chain so that you can get an early heads up on risks coming your way. One organization that was very successful in navigating the pandemic did so because their suppliers in China gave them an early heads up that something was happening and they were able to react more quickly because they had early knowledge. So build those relationships and that's gonna be really important when it comes to environmental and sustainability risks and those before those things impact your organization. Third, use technology as a tool to support better decision-making. I can't tell you how many organizations I've spoken to that are in the middle of em embracing some new tool, new technology, new system, whether it's their ERP system or they're implementing a warehouse management system, transportation management. Data is only helpful if it's timely and organized in a way that informs rather than overwhelms. Technology plus human insights and decision-making will drive supply chain success. The tool isn't the answer. The tool is the enabler. And as long as we remember that, there is always going to be a role for human decision-making in our organization. The best AI that we can use still needs to be put into context with human knowledge and insights. And then lastly, focus on your people. 
They are the most essential resource in any supply chain organization. Emphasize recruiting, retaining, reskilling employees so that they can effectively and efficiently collaborate and communicate with your suppliers, with your other supply chain partners and your customers. A skilled and well-equipped workforce will enable your organization to focus on customer satisfaction rather than just cost savings, and that's essential for long-term growth. So again, there's no denying that supply chains are in the spotlight for better or for worse. And it's time that as supply chain leaders, we step forward and we say we are informed decision makers, data-driven problem solvers, and trusted collaborators. So I mentioned that I have some recommended resources for you. One of the things is the now in the resource library that APQC updates periodically. It has links to all the newest content that we've published, but specific to the 2023 priorities and challenges, you're welcome to download, APQC members are welcome to download the white paper. And we also have a collection, including the survey report, which is open to the public. We highly recommend you take a look, see what you think. And we've published some industry reports so that organizations can see from an industry perspective, how does it look? What are the priorities? What are the challenges? What are the trends? And then we have a number of resources available and I'm not gonna to talk to everything on these slides, but just to mention in supply chain planning, we did some joint research with BCG uh, and you can see it's the link here about if disruption is the new normal, then operational resilience is the new necessity. And we also have supply chain control tower content, a case study and a number of tools and templates as organizations seek to increase transparency and build that kind of an important tool while retaining the importance of accountability, responsibility, and understanding who takes action on those results. In sourcing and procurement, I'll just mention, we've got a, an article on how to address supplier risk with business continuity plans. And also if you're looking to implement something like robotic process automation, it's a great technology, but you have to avoid the temptation that, you know, if you have a hammer, then everything is a nail because RPA doesn't fit in every situation. And we have some guidance on the governance that you need to ensure a successful rollout of an RPA program across supply chain. Also moving into innovation, um, great webinar and content we've got on breaking down silos for better collaboration. And building silos is really just a, a human instinct. It's not that employees are wrong or bad or malicious. It's what happens kind of naturally. So what can the organization do to cross those silos to intentionally make sure knowledge flows sideways as well as up and down inside the organization, even on the diagonal. Another thing I'll call your attention to is some content we did in conjunction with Steve Wunker on cost ovation and bringing innovation to the cost side of the business. So innovation is not only in terms of products and services. You can innovate in many other ways inside the organization. And we've got some content on how to embrace failure on the road to innovation. And that's one of the things that if the organization doesn't try new things, you're not gonna go anywhere different than you are today. So it's important to try and fail and to make sure that that's okay, that the organization has bumpers that make sure that even if an innovation fails, customers, you know, you aren't impacting your ability to serve, but you are creating a space where that can happen. And then logistics, the best place to start here is to see how your performance stacks up to your peers and your competitors. And we've got an, an interactive tune-up diagnostic and some new practices reports that cover everything from last mile logistics to environmental sustainability, workforce development practices and more. So I am going to pause now and take some questions. Um, Please let me know what questions you might have about the research, about APQC's data and our take on this, where things are going. Um, I see that we do have one comment. Someone said, make sure your control towers are actionable. Beware of them. It's, it's an important point because you don't want to invest all that resource, time, money, effort into them, and then have them just be a thing that nobody owns, nobody takes action on. So, 
Um, we did get a question about where these slides will be posted. So let me uh, just let you know that within a few days, APQC will email both a link to the slides as well as the recording of today's webinar to everybody who registered. And then we'll also be publishing these in our resource library. Um, so everyone who's registered, you will get the slides and the recording via email and also the links that are in here to all the additional content, some of which is available only to our members, others are available to the general public. And in the interest of time, let me just give a few other reminders, um, but do feel free to submit your questions. Um, we have a webinar satisfaction survey that will pop up for you after the webinar closes. We do value your feedback and input. Please let us know what you think. We take it seriously. Um, also, you can look at apqc.org slash events to see what other webinars we have coming up. Next year, we're gonna repeat an on-demand webinar that was very popular on bridging silos um, and how do you break those silos across the organization. So I highly recommend that for those of you for whom collaboration was one of your top challenges. And then we also have an on-demand webinar page where you can watch any prior APQC webinar on demand. Well, I wanna thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. And you're welcome to send me any questions you might have via email, um, stay in contact with me or any of my APQC colleagues. You're welcome to connect with us um, on LinkedIn, Twitter, our blog page, Facebook, wherever your social media outlet of choices. So um, and before we wrap up, I just wanna answer one question we received. With some manufacturers and some supply chains now reshoring back to the USA, what do you think will happen in the next few years? Is reshoring this a permanent thing or will it be just a blip on the radar? That's a great question. And that's a question that a lot of people are wrestling with right now. And I think what's going to happen is we'll see that for certain industries that are deemed, um, we'll, we'll say high value from a, a national security perspective, we will see more of a, uh, I can't say permanent because really what in life today is permanent, but we'll see more of a shift to reshoring or ally shoring, um, which I, I heard a recent presentation where the speaker said, you know, friend shoring is one thing, but allies are deeper than friends. Um, part of the challenge with the push toward near shoring, reshoring, ally shoring, or just we'll call it relocating, part of the challenge is it's not easy. Because as I said earlier, you need the skilled labor to be there, but you also need the resources. And that's one of the things that the United States doesn't have an unlimited supply of every rare metal and all the critical resources needed. And the other thing that I've heard from a number of people is that there's economies of scale to be gained when you have a cluster in a certain location of all these companies in the, in the same industry locating there. And so it attracts talent, it attracts investment, and it makes it a lot easier for them to operate. So I think there are a number of barriers that will prevent it from being kind of a all cases, all situations. But I do think it's not just a blip on the radar. I think there is has become an awareness that there are certain things we can't afford to be without as a country. Um, things related to healthcare or national defense or things like that, that maybe we outsourced too much. So some of it might be coming back here. I know there's um, a lot of people looking at Mexico as an alternative to, you know, far away, because then when you shorten the supply chain, then you remove some of the barriers that you might have from long transit times or, um, you know, other things like that. But again, it comes back to infrastructure, security, uh, so there's a lot of dimensions to it. It's not a quick, easy answer, I think. But I do think we'll see some of it shift back permanently and some of it may shift back temporarily. And some things may never come back here because it doesn't make sense. Like the United States may never become the global manufacturer for children's toys. Like that may never come back here because it financially doesn't make sense. But there are things like PPE or other very sensitive things that we need to make sure we have an adequate supply that we might see at least partially, maybe not the entire industry, but part come back here. So long answer to your question, Linda, but thanks for asking. Well, I wanna thank all of you again for joining us today. 
and invite you to continue connecting and asking your questions and collaborating with us. And if you don't already, please follow us on social media. Make sure you stay engaged and get the latest updates. Thank you everyone for joining and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.